Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Executive Director of the George W. Bush Institute, Holly Kuzmich. Good evening. It's great to have you all here in person tonight. Welcome to a special edition of Engage at the Bush Center presented by Highland Capital Management. Tonight is our Highland Capital Lecture. Each year, this program takes a deep dive into an important policy issue. And tonight, we hope you're going to get a better understanding of the life, culture, and commerce of our southern border. We're deeply grateful to Highland Capital Management for endowing this Engage series and making events like tonight possible. I also want to thank our board members and executive advisory council members for being here tonight, as well as everybody who's joining us virtually via live stream. Our goal with the Engage series is to help our audience think about an issue in a new way. This year, connected to President Bush's newest book, Out of Many One, which I know he would want me to mention, it's a number one New York Times bestseller, and the accompanying special exhibit at the Bush Center, we have engaged in important policy work on the need for immigration reform. Our team is led by our policy experts, Laura Collins and Matt Rooney, who are here tonight. They have engaged with policymakers on a whole host of recommendations on improving immigration and our immigration system. And one of the important points that we make is that effective border security includes reform to our broken immigration system. Tonight, we have a really terrific lineup of experts who we hope will advance this important conversation. First is Geronimo Gutierrez Fernandez, currently a senior advisor at Covington and Burling. A native of Mexico City, he has more than 20 years in senior in experience in senior government positions under five Mexican presidents in the areas of finance, trade, national security, and diplomacy. He served as Mexico's ambassador to the U.S. in 2017 and 2018, and in that role, he played a prominent position in the negotiation of the trade agreement between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Also here tonight is former Congressman Will Hurd, who represented Texas's 23rd Congressional District from 2015 until earlier this year. The district stretches 550 miles along the U.S.-Mexico border. Congressman Hurd is also a former undercover CIA officer and cybersecurity expert. We also welcome conservationist, documentary filmmaker, and the former associate director of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, Jay Clayberg. He co-produced the acclaimed 2019 film, The River and the Wall. He's lived and worked on both sides of the border, and he clearly loves the land. As part of filming The River and the Wall, Jay traveled 1,200 miles along the border from El Paso to the Gulf of Mexico on horses, mountain bikes, and canoes. We're pleased to have with us Adair Margo, who recently completed her term as the First Lady of El Paso. During the Bush administration, she served eight years as chairman of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. In 2018, President Bush awarded her the Presidential Citizens Medal. That was one year after Mexican President Felipe Calderon awarded her the Order of the Aztec Eagle, the highest honor that can be presented to a non-Mexican citizen. Adair has been involved in the El Paso Juarez border community her entire life. And finally, to moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by founder and CEO of the Texas Tribune, Evan Smith. The Texas Tribune is an online, nonprofit, nonpartisan public media organization that was launched in 2009, and he previously served many years as editor of Texas Monthly. Please join me in welcoming Evan and our participants to the stage. Good evening, and good evening to our great panelists. Good to be with you. Thank you for being here. It's okay to be with you, Evan. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I know you hate the media, but try tonight just to be... Yeah. Um, I want to ask you all to begin our conversation tonight by defining terms. When we talk about the border, what do we mean? Different people, when they hear the border, think of different things. Of course, we know the border is not just one thing. El Paso. Adair is not the rural region, or at least parts of Will's old district that Congressman Hurd represented for three terms. It's not the Rio Grande Valley. When we think or talk about the border, Jay, let me ask this question of you. What do we mean? Is this more of a state of mind than anything concrete? 
Yeah, for me, it's, uh, I think about it from you know, conservation, land, water, wildlife perspective. It's yep. a, a confluence of all of these diverse ecosystems, and they just happen to be joined in the middle, at least in Texas, by the second longest river in the United States, the Rio Grande. And what that connects in El Paso is El Paso Juarez and all of these communities. Yep. In the Big Bend, it's the Sierra Madres to the Guadalupe Mountains and the Davis Mountains. East of there, it's the um, you know, Gulf of Mexico uh, and the subtropics. It's McAllen, Reynosa, it's the lower Rio Grande Valley as we know. Um, it changes almost every couple of hundred miles yep. uh, as you go from the, the southern extent of the Rocky Mountains at 4,000 feet to, to sea level. It's, um, to me, it's a, uh, it's a wild place, and I saw that on our, our journey. Yep. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a really diverse place, more than just uh, from a biological perspective, from a cultural perspective as well. <clears throat> now, that's one answer. Uh, Adair, we were talking back a stage before we came out, and you said, don't think of it as the border. Think of it as the epicenter. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, it was something I was just discussing with an artist uh, who uh, has moved to El Paso and he's spending time trying to pull together. He's, he's doing a flag. He's doing new designs of everything, trying to define who we are uh, because, it's, it, it, because it really is, as Jay says, it's a confluence of so many things right. coming together. And, he, uh, and I agree so often when we talk about a border, it's sort of minim it's kind of the edge of something. Uh, that I just finished a school on a Methodist mission school that educates kids in Juarez, and they talked about the antipodes or the border. It's like way out there beyond anything. Right. But really this confluence of all the, these activities that are there that not only are culture, but with the Maquilas and Juarez and um, you know, all the different, the cultures that have come, we really are the Ellis Island of the South in many ways. So there are all these ideas, all these different uh, kinds of people, activities, that it's an epicenter rather than a border, which I like. We always talk about ourselves not as El Paso, but as a region. We are a tri-state region. So when we talk about El Paso, we're incomplete if we're not also talking about Chihuahua and New Mexico. Yep. It's just, I mean, all together with Las Cruces, New Mexico, El Paso, Texas, and, and Juarez, Mexico, we're a population of, you know, 2.7 million people the largest bilingual, binational, bicultural region in the Western Hemisphere. All the assets here are incredible. Yeah, I, I love this, Adair. And Mr. Ambassador, this is a terrific point that Adair is making about the binational nature of at least her, you know, as she's, her definition of this, I think, really puts me in a mind to ask you about borders as dividing lines, but also borders as almost might be combining lines. You know, the relationship between Texas and Mexico at any given time and at any given point along this border, that is a significant part of our understanding of what the border means here and in Mexico. Is I, it I think, Evan, that borders, you know, there's a good reason to have borders. Right. And that will always continue to be the case. It's just how do you view them? In the case of the U.S.-Mexico border, I would say, uh, going to, again to your question, I would say, number one, it's the people. The border, yep. it's the people. Yep. We're talking about maybe 30 million people persons that live within a stretch of 100 miles either side, that daily, on a daily basis, interact with one another for education purposes, for trade, for businesses. They, some people would even cross and go to the grocery on the other side. And you cannot avoid to think about its own dynamic. I think that is extremely important. Yep. People at the border often uh, you know, joke uh, that if, if Washington and Mexico City would leave the border alone, they, you know, they will figure it out. And they, there's some truth to that, right? Um, I, I think that the border region, it's, it's uh, in a sense, it's a region in itself. Uh, it has many advantages, and it's uh, economically, it's, it's, it's actually gr it's grown faster than the rest of the countries on both sides. Yep. Also in population terms, it's grown extremely. And that poses obviously a series of challenges. But I, I, would, I would stay, uh, the border is first and foremost, it's people. There's 30 million people that on a daily basis interact for whatever reason on the other side. And 
the, the truth is that the vast majority of those interactions benefit both nations as a whole. And I think that is extremely important. Yeah. Sure, we have to work together on security, and, and that is extremely important. We need to tackle issues like immigration that are tough in the yeah. United States and Mexico. But um, it's an opportunity for us, I think. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm down with the opportunity idea, but Congressman, what the ambassador said about the controversies around issues and the complications around politics are undeniably true as a recovering member of Congress. You know, because you've been in those rooms, that how Congress and how politics think of the border, it can be a political football or a campaign prop. It's easy but dangerous to forget that there are, to the ambassador's point, real people and real communities affected by the rhetoric. Talk about, talk about how you see the border through the lens of the political world that you inhabit. So, so the border is an edge, but it's also a middle. Right? And, and it's a place that, we, and, and, and Matt Rooney can, can, can fact check me on this, is like t a, a half of the goods and services that are used in the rest of the country come through the border. Right. Right? And, and you don't have two cities on either side, you have, you have one community, you have people living on both sides and working on both sides and going back and forth. Um, but it's also a political bludgeon that both sides, both political parties, try to use to hit the other person over the head. And the current crisis that we're in was predictable because guess what? We've been there three other times in the last, in the last decade and a half. And part of the problem is people don't go down there. People that, I, I always say, I, 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 there was a number, there was a period where I was having you know, daily interaction with my colleagues on this topic. And I said, you're not allowed to talk about the border unless you've been there a few times. Yep. Go in there once to get a photo op is not enough. No, you have to go there to understand the unique challenges. And, and I would say every mile of the border is different than every other part of the border. To secure it, there are parts that it requires Border Patrol hours to days to respond to something in that part of, of the border. Yep. And, and these are some of the things that folks don't understand. And, and, the, and the broader issue of the security in that area, the border communities are some of the safest places in the United States of America. And, and despite, we always, despite what we hear every even numbered year sure. at election time. Yeah, right? and, 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 and let me say, so, so the, the, the immigration crisis and the crisis we're currently dealing with now is a public safety issue for people on the ground, right? When, pe when people that live there are talking about border security, it's a public safety issue. Um, and and so, so it's maybe clear that there's a problem there right now, um, but on the whole, these are communities that have been, have been super safe. So I want to talk about the, the concept of a dividing line in a physical sense, a barrier between uh, our two countries, and the idea that we have kind of a wild border, to Jay's point. <clears throat> we have a clip teed up uh, from Jay's 2019, the film that he produced in 2019, The River and the Wall, that actually features Congressman Heard in an area of the border that we have to describe fairly as wild. And it gives us a sense of exactly what you're hearing from our panelists. Let's go ahead and tee that clip up, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about barriers. We need our, our men and women in Border Patrol to know exactly what the threat is so they're not showing up with no information about what's going on. And, and so that's why getting the right tools is important. And, and I, think, I think folks need to realize that, you know, um, that we want to secure the border. We should have secured our border by now. Let's roll. Uh, Y'all start going. Okay, we're going we're gonna to head back. There is there's like, there's a canal right there. We just cross the canal. I'll take my shirt. Sure. I mean, we could, but we could. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's be an adventure, right? Take a jump right here. We can just sail right yeah, over. Yeah, there you go. This is deep. I carry five bikes in my hand. Oh, that's nice. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Y'all didn't tell me it was cold. <laughs> Getting the congressman in a bit of a pickle here. Here we go. Go ahead. You want the camera or you want your hand? I'll take your hand. Yeah. Okay, three. Hey, uh, your government salutes you. I'm sure I get to my next appointment on time. <laughs> He got two credits for that. He got in the film, 
as actor and congressman, and then also as a key grip for, uh, for, for, carry, for, for carrying equipment. For carrying equipment. Yeah. Well, yeah. And let me be clear. Yeah. I was only with him for like 10 miles, okay? <laughs> they, they, they did 1,200. 1,200 yeah. miles. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Jay, Jay, I mean, to the clip that we just saw and to the point we've been discussing, the, the concept of a barrier along that border is so, it made so difficult just by the land. Right. And you, and you know that having spent all that time, right? Yeah, I mean, you go uh, 200 miles east of El Paso and all of a sudden the Eagle Mountains come down and there, there was a point, uh, they, they cross the river and the road stops. It, it can't go any further because you have just this monolith that's, that's in the middle. So we end up having to ditch our bikes and walk for 30 miles because right. we couldn't go any further. And then another 200 miles from there, and there are there's about 250 miles of 1,500 foot sheer cliffs, uh, San, Santa Elena Canyon, and the lower canyons, basically all the way to Lake Amistad. Uh, and, and so thinking about, do you already have a physical barrier there? You've got this, the northern extent of the Sierra Madres that come up there as well. And there's nothing, there's 300 miles to Muskies is, is the nearest, basically right. nearest town there. Um, it's, it's a much wilder country than most people that don't live um, along the border realize. F fully, fully appreciate it. Uh, Ambassador, what was Mexico's view of the discussion that really heated up over the last couple of years about some kind of physical barrier between the two borders? As you know, our governor announced last week that he believes that we need to go ahead as a state and do the job that the federal government was not able to do in building a border, uh, some kind of a wall along the border, some kind of a barrier. What, what is the view from, from the Mexican side? Well, I, I, I lived up and close the discussion uh, during the past few years on the so-called border wall. Yep. And the, the position in general was very simple. First, you know, I guess most Mexicans, obviously it's government understood that every country has the right to protect its border. And I don't think that has ever been challenged on the Mexican side. Yep. Number two, if you have so much at stake in a relationship uh, as the one, you know, as it actually happens, um, it's worthwhile discussing what are the best ways to address shared security concerns. Yep. Um, and, and there are good reasons to work for Mexico to work with the U.S. and address every sort of security concern, whether it's drug trafficking or human trafficking or, you know, whatever you name it. And I think that if you look at the past 20 years, security cooperation between Mexico and the United States has improved dramatically. Uh, and people don't often know about. We have, you know, the level of intelligence we share for border security is unprecedented. And I think that's a good uh, thing. And I think it's on the best interest of Mexico to actually work with the US. Now, having said that, if you ask us, and I think 99.9% .9 of the Mexican, is building a wall the best idea? No, we really don't think so. It's, it, you know, it, they, they're, you know, a security strategy, and the congressman here might, you know, can certainly correct me, but any security strategy is three things. is identifying what the risks are and the threats, you know, thinking about their likelihood, what's the probability that they will occur, and then putting whatever resources you have available to, you know, lower that probability. And I think there are far better ways to do that than building a wall. And we're respectful, I think in Mexicans in general are respectful of what, you know, how the United States decides to protect its border. But it's just, we think that there are better options. And, and probably the, the best you know, notion is preclearance. Most of the things that we do at the border could improve the movement of goods and people and trucks, literally billions of dollars a day can improve if we preclear, if we use technology to make right. sure that whatever goes through the border is safe, it's secure, it's legal. And then we can use resources, both the US and Mexico, and, and pull the resources to really address what are true challenges and true threats to our shared security. Yeah. I think that's, but, but and, and the other thing to be absolutely honest is that a, a fence has, the fence along the border was started to build maybe 91, if I'm not mistaken, so it's not new. And, and, you know, and different pieces have been built for different reasons throughout time. 
What made it different, to be honest, I think that for the first time during the past few years, Mexico, Mexicans felt offended by the way this was presented. And the pretension that we would pay for it was, well, sorry, it was a bit nuts, I have to say, it now that I'm not a, an ambassador. I mean, can, <laughs> can we work jointly in security? Right. Yes. Should Mexico be concerned about this and work with the United States? Of course. But it was a bit difficult. Right. That one was a bit difficult to swallow. Now, now you tell us. OK. Um, <laughs> Adair, I want to ask you, based on what you said earlier about the relationship between El Paso and Juarez, if the idea of some kind of barrier between those two sister cities ultimately hurts more than it helps in the sense of impeding the relationship. I mean, you've been the chief promoter of border culture, the chief patron on, of, of border culture for so long. You know the importance of the come and go relationship between those two cities. Yes, I do know the importance of come and go. We've always had what we used to have when I was growing up and when I had my art gallery, I'd go down and photograph people walking, coming across right. the border. We had a chain link fence. We called it the tortilla curtain and it was filled with holes. And, and, uh, and, and, and then, you know, it was Sylvester Reyes, who was head of Border Patrol in El Paso, that started, it was called Operation Hold the Line, right. where actually they put, you know, uh, uh, borders, uh, Border Patrol people within viewing distance, and it cut it, it, of each other, so they wouldn't, it wasn't this cat and mouse game where people would come over and then they'd take them back and then they'd come over. And at first, living there, it was sensitive because you think it's giving the message of, oh no, we just want everybody to come over. Well, car thefts dropped. Um, when, when, you know, uh, bicycle thefts, I mean, things dropped and people got behind it. And under President Bush, I don't like the name wall. You don't put walls between neighbors. You have a fence, and it's really what we have. And initially, it was attractive when Laura Bush came and visited Chihuahuita, which is this little neighborhood down in the, it's El Paso's oldest neighbor, you know, oldest neighborhood. It's right there on the river. Well, when, you know, when she went down there, and she, she says, you know, it's really, you know, it's like a Richard Serra. And, you know, it's more attractive than this tilted arc. I don't know if you all remember. You can see through it. The people who lived in Chihuahuita were grateful for it, and Bush put that in. Because when they do Christmas ornaments at Christmas time, people would come over and, you know, take their Christmas ornament and then disappear. You know, that's always when you live on a border, if you do something bad on one side, you just go the other where, where different rules apply. You know, you just disappear. Yeah. So they, they liked it. What I find offensive is, is like putting concertina, is that how you call it, the wire, wire on right. it. And, you know, we are family. We have grandmothers, uh, grandparents crossing over to come to quinceañeras. We have ch school children crossing from Juarez every single day to go to Lydia Patterson Institute. Little Methodist mission school started in the Mexican Revolution. It served kids from Juarez ever since. UTEP, 10% of their students. I mean, all right. what I, but a bridge, so a bridge where you legally cross doesn't need wire on it. It should be welcoming for legal immigration or for families visiting each other. But the thing is, it's gotten confused. They think, well, drug dealers might be there, so we're going to put... Well, well no, it's, it's people coming and going, shopping. We need the commerce, and it kills us when we're not fully staffed either. I mean, we've never been fully staffed in El Paso on the border, on the bridge. On the bridge. On the bridge. On the bridge. Specifically. But I think the wall, anyway, we won't, but no, you've we done need a, to be you're, welcoming. You're good. It's, it's like crossing a beautiful bridge to go see your neighbors, you know? You don't, but. Um, con con Congressman, I appreciate Adair's perspective on this. Let me shift the conversation a little bit back to the conversation that you would have in your district. Again, a very large, maybe the largest congressional district, right? Sure. Uh, with, with the most contiguous miles with the Mexican border of any congressional district in the country, your, your old district, the 23rd. Um, did you have a sense when we were in Congress, again, to your point about people who are not at the border or from the border, telling people along the border what they should do or how we should deal with the border from a policy standpoint. I'm thinking about investment. Do we invest enough either as a state or as a federal government in the border region? Do we invest enough on things like education, on health care, on infrastructure? 
isn't so much of the conversation ultimately about how we can lift up people, create an opportunity for people in border communities, including the ones you represented. Are, are we doing enough to do that? Uh, no. Uh, why, why are our, our border checkpoints not look like air airports? Right. It's it's the same. It's the same concept. Yeah. And, and and ultimately, look, I'm the only member of Congress in the history of Congress. Actually, I think I, I um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one in history of Congress that have ever stamped visas, and illegally crossed borders, in alias. Right. <laughs> so so um, I, I I can see both sides of this, and and we focus on the wrong metrics. The metric we should be focusing on is not how much fence or wall or what name we use it. We should be focusing on are we preventing illegal immigration from coming across and are we preventing um, illegal drugs and other contraband from coming back and forth. Are, are we able to get operational control of our border? That means do we know everything that's going back and forth, right? Those are the metrics that we should be, we should be using. And, and unfortunately, uh, we know for the last 30 years where a physical barrier makes sense. When there's urban to urban contact, if, if a, some kind of barrier makes sense because it allows, if something wrong or something illegal is, go, is happening, it allows law enforcement in order to respond. It increases the response time uh, for, for law enforcement to get there. Now, when you can see in the Chihuahuan Desert, for 200 miles, a camera will do, right? Exactly. And, and so, so we need that mile by mile assessment. Guess what? It's been done. The technology exists yeah. for us to have that total operational picture of, of what's going back and, and, and forth across our border. And like the ambassador said, if we pre-clear the good stuff, we can then focus on the bad stuff. Depending on who you talk to, 50 billion with a B to $150 billion of illegal drugs is coming across our border. You're not humping that in a backpack to bring that amount of, of yep. product across the border. It's coming through ports of entries, so we need to focus there. Oh, and by the way, if we streamline legal immigration, exactly. then you are gonna be able to decrease some of the, 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 the pressures you're seeing on the border. If we treat human smugglers and human traffickers, which are different, human trafficking is sexual slavery, right? That, that's, that's what it is, and the fact that it still exists in the world in 2021 is insane. Why are we not putting the same level of attention and focus on those organizations as we do on terrorist organizations? We are not using all the tools in our toolkit to stop some of these problems. Oh, and by the way, there's a little thing called the Northern Triangle where they have you know, um, uh, extreme poverty, lack of economic opportunity, and, and violence. If you address that, you're gonna stop those push, those pull factors coming into the United States. So, so it's complicated, but those are all the steps we should be doing not fighting about whether we call it a wall or a fence, yep. how much of it should be there, right? And that's how we, that's how we solve this problem. But would you, would you be redirecting resources? You can let them clap for that. It was only you know? one person clapping. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'll, I'll clap for yeah, you. We'll yeah, double yeah. the number of people <laughs> clapping. Yeah, yeah. Um, would you redirect some of the resources that are now being dedicated quickly, uh, Congressman, to uh, to barriers or to security, to some of the social infrastructure issues that the region may need. Again, back to things like education. I mean, I, I note every year that four of the five most uninsured counties in the entire United States are along the Texas-Mexico border. Could we not be redirecting some of those resources to invest in those communities and to lift up some of the people who live along, along the border? Well, a congressman, oh. yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think we should be looking at all of our funding programs to make sure we're looking at this as a holistic problem, right? right. And, and so whether you move funds from one place to another, uh, there's probably some opportunities, but let's start with right. being that operational picture of what's coming back and forth across the border and then make sure that we recognize the role that this community has on the rest of the nation. Right. Uh, Jay, to the point of the community, you brought up the people of the border and, of course, again, your film... You spent a lot of time talking to people mm -hmm. all along the border. J Jay, are we listening enough to the voices of border residents as we have conversations about what's right from a culture standpoint, an economic standpoint, a security standpoint? Are the people of the border being heard by people making decisions about the border in your mind? I, I don't think so, and I think you would may say the same, that a lot of the, the counties that are right there on the border, at least you know, west of Laredo, are some of the least populated places in the state. Yep. And then as you get into the Rio Grande Valley, you also have communities that don't vote 
in high numbers. And so those two things don't bode well for representation or being heard by, uh, right. by their representatives. I think that the people that we talked to, whether it was a woman that owned a restaurant near Tornillo or a rancher in the Big Bend or a farmer in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, labor was still, I mean, I think labor has, has always been a, um, a matter of, of life down there, that it would come back and forth across the border. It was an exchange. Yep. Uh, and now that's harder and harder to do. You've got the H-2A program, but that is even difficult to comply with as, as far as farming and ranching and, and the agricultural business. And then the other aspect is when, when you actually go and, and look at where, and, and I'll go back just to the structure one more time. If you go back and look at where existing structure has been, been built, not in El Paso necessarily, but the fence there is right on the river. It's right on the border itself. But as you go down to the, to the valley, even where we were in that clip, that was a quarter mile to half mile away from the river. In the Rio Grande Valley, it's a mile to two miles. Right. And so you're looking at then private land farmland, ranch land, that's on the other side now of the fence. And so you're talking about private property rights in a state that is pretty pro-private -pro property, property rights. rights. Yes. And those voices, if you see, it, see what has been built 700 miles along the U.S.-Mexico border, right. those voices aren't being heard. Uh, Adair, do you think that we have a problem with people having misperceptions about the border? I mean, again, yeah. Will, Will made the point earlier, about, and I keep coming back to this, that people in politics will occasionally feel the right to pronounce wisdom on the border, having not spent a significant amount of time there. No time. Yeah. They've never come. What, what, are, the great, what are the great misperceptions about the border, as in your experience? Well, the, you know, I think there's a lot. I mean, it's, it, I'll tell you, I served on the Texas, first of all, danger. I mean, to be, it's so dangerous. I mean, we have a new head of our medical school, Rick Lang, who came and is running the Paul Foster Medical School, first medical school on the U.S.-Mexico border. And his parents said, oh, it's so dangerous, you can't go there. In fact, my, I have a new neighbor who moved from Johnson City, Tennessee, and her mother goes, oh, you can't go there. I mean, it's so dangerous. El Paso's always ranked one of the safest, safest in the cities right. in the United States for a population of 500,000 or more on crime statistics reported to the FBI. So it's always been a safe city. Also, Juarez, at one time, not long ago, was the deadliest city in the world, while El Paso remained one of the safest. Now, what is that? Right. And we are kind of a pressure valve for our friends in Mexico who needed you know, to come. But danger, danger is one of them. But I'll tell you another thing. The way we operate on the border, I didn't recognize ourselves at the Higher Education Coordinating Board when I served on it. There are all these, this data, dropout rate. And, and I, I thought, God, it just sounds so dismal. And when they talked about the dropout rate at UTEP, for instance, I said, well, I wonder if they consider if they're going to Wasejota or if they're going to New Mexico State. I mean, it's just like the information drops off, so it's not really three-dimensional. So I've always, there are lots of misperceptions, but when people come and discover it and see it and how it works, working together, helping each other, a hospital. It's not just people coming from Mexico in our hospitals. I'm involved with a hospital on Juarez where uninsured, that's another thing, uninsured people. I'll go over there and it'll be filled with American citizens who are seeking their care at this wonderful hospital. It doesn't have the technology that some of ours have, but it's wonderful primary care. And they're over there. What they pay for their services is less than a, than a deductible would be in the United States. So it's, 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 it's an epicenter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah amb ambassador, from the, again, from the perspective uh, in, in, in Mexico, what are the misperceptions as you see it about this region? I think that unfortunately what happens uh, is often that we, you know, we get the bad news from the border, or not only the bad news. Yeah. That's, that I think it's, it's uh, to some extent expected because you know, bad news so sometimes traffic, you know, travels you know, broader and more you know, stronger. But I think that, and, and that's, that's the main, I think, misperception about the border. I would be naive to say that there are not important challenges that we do have to tackle and that Mexico has to tackle. Um, U.S. cities 
all along the border are pretty safe, as, as we were just commenting. Mexican cities, there are, there are some cities along the border on the Mexican side whose standards of security are simply unacceptable. And I, I cannot deny that. And that's mostly what you get. Um, you get very gruesome images sometimes of things going on at the border. But you don't hear the good stories. Yeah. Let me give you just you know, a two, two of them. One, um, have we actually managed since 1944 our joint river basins? Um, it's an example internationally. And we have the IBWC, um, which is a binational institution that has helped us address water issues along the Colorado and the Grande River for more, you know, for decades. And that doesn't mean that we have not challenges. We, we do, but it works. And we've never had any serious problems so far. And it, it involves, you know, having both sides thinking carefully and jointly about what to, to, how to address that issue. And I would refer also to the trade and the economic vitality of the border. We now have a new trade agreement, USMCA. It's not perfect, but it works. Hopefully, we'll have it in place for the next 25 years that we do in NAFTA. We trade more than 1.5 billion every single day. Texas, Mexico is obvious Texas' number one market. Number one. Exports, more. Mo Texas exports yeah. more than 100 billion a year. Do you think people appreciate the economic? I mean, Will, I asked the same question to you. Do you think people fully appreciate the economic impact? I think they're just beginning to appreciate what that means and the level of employment that it generates for both sides. And I mentioned this because the trade story along the border is extremely successful. It, the, the border grows faster economically than the rest of the countries precisely because of that reason. And going to your question on investment, I would say that one area that we need to look at and following Congressman Hurt's uh, comment, our port of entries for the 21st century need to be completely different. They need to have a convention center probably. They need to be very secure you know, with the right authorities doing what needs to be done with pre-clearance, but we need to think about them as an area of economic opportunity that would allow our trade to go very quickly, but that will also convene business interest from both sides. And if you look at some of that, you know, we have more than 15 binational, if you like to call it, metropolitan areas throughout the border. Yep. From Tijuana and uh, San Diego to Matamoros and Brownsville. And those, those experiences are extremely rich in terms of cultural vitality, economic opportunity. Um, and and that's, that, I think, is the story that does not flow throughout our, you know, the, the rest of the nations. Let, let me go to the congressman and ask him to comment on the economic opportunity, both leveraged and missed along the border. U.S. economic and military dominance is no longer guaranteed, right? Because we have, not a near peer, a peer yep. called the, the Chinese government. And the way we can compete with the, the way the, the Chinese government is trying to surpass the United States as a, as a global superpower is by leveraging North American competitiveness, right? And the opportunity that we have to, to work with our allies of, in, in Mexico and then also Canada in this effort is important. We gotta make sure that the American economy stays the most important economy in, in the world, and we have an opportunity to do that working with our, our southern neighbor. But we can't get to having these kinds of conversations because we've made continued mistakes that is causing, you know, not everybody is an asylum seeker. So you can't treat everybody like an asylum seeker. That is what's overrunning uh, detention facilities. That is what's overrunning local communities along the border. The, the, these, these cities, these counties, they have been overwhelmed. Take COVID, which everybody was impacted by, then you add the most illegal immigration that the United States has seen in the last 20 years. That's, that's a statement from the current Secretary of, of, of Homeland Security. So our inability to solve these problems is preventing us 
from taking advantage of these opportunities that the ambassador has talked about in order to improve American yep. competitiveness in the rest of the world. This is going to impact all of us, right? It's going to impact you know, how much money is in our 401k and how much we're going to be able to take out of it when we retire. It's going to impact us on you know, the food we put on a table and the clothes we put on our back. This is the seriousness of this problem. And if we don't start addressing it, this opportunity is going to, is going yep. to, to we're, going to, we're going to miss it. Jay, can I just I just want yeah. to add something <clears throat> to that in this mis idea of misconception, and the and the fact is is that there's a net positive gain to Texas in being so close to Mexico, and from the environmental perspective, in any given year we get 70 to 90 percent of the flow in the Rio Grande River there at the Rio Conchas, at Presidio that ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. 98 percent of humans and wildlife depend on that river from Presidio down to the Gulf. That's McAllen, that's Eagle Pass, that's Reynosa, Brownsville, Matamoros. The second is we wouldn't have, and this may be a shock to some people and to others not, uh, black bear in the state of Texas if it weren't for Mexico. Right. In 1985, a black bear came out of the, the uh, Mareras del Carmen, mm -hmm. the northern extent of the Sierras, uh, right there at, at near Boquillas, crossed the river, and now we have you know, more than 100 black bear in the state of Texas that were extirpated by us right. in the early 1900s. So from an environmental perspective, it's, yeah. it's a net gain. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna talk about environmental, the, 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 from an environmental perspective, the land, environmental integrity, and, and biodiversity. Again, we have a clip from your film that I want us to tee up uh, a conversation about the land. If we can go ahead and show this next clip related to biodiversity, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about the land jig. On this trip, I'm going to be doing as many bird surveys along the route as I can fit in. My intention is to survey these areas that nobody's really surveyed birds before to see what the biodiversity is before a potential border wall is built. When you think high bird diversity or just high biodiversity, you don't think of a desert, but as some of the highest vegetation diversity and therefore bird diversity, because you have all these different elevations and you have the Rio Grande going through that creates completely different habitat. If you're just cruising on by, and you're gonna think there's not anything here. But if you just stop and like look around and listen for a little bit, you realize this place is alive. You know, Jay, I'm, I'm struck by, in watching that again, and I remember thinking when I saw the film in 2019, how extraordinary it is to see that view of the border because we forget that there are so many parts of the border that have remained largely unchanged mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. But the reality is the border is itself, you know, the, the story of change is the story of the border. I mean, we've heard versions of that tonight. You know, the heritage and history, just to pick one example, of ranching along the border. You grew up on your family's storied property in South Texas. People think about the land differently, of course, from the time that your ancestors founded King Ranch in 1853. But I'd also argue that the conversation about the ranching tradition is different from 1953 mm -hmm. today or different from 2003. We are seeing aspects. I mean, so much of what is maintained along the border, there is also so much change. The modern world is a change agent as it relates to the border and the land. Can you just reflect a little bit about that? Because I think we can't fully appreciate or understand the border without understanding what's changed in addition to what hasn't. Yeah, I'll, I'll focus on one thing that, that hasn't really changed. And in 1853, my ancestor was uh, running a steamboat on the Rio Grande, and he was, tra he was trading. Yeah. And tra trade was a, a, a fact of life uh, along the border, and it still is today. It's what drives the economy there. What has changed, at least from you know ranching perspective, is in 1853 to the late you know 1800s, um, a lot of our our wildlife uh, was hunted out due to unregulation uh, or lack of regulation. 
livestock was, was king through the, I would say the 1970s or, or 80s, regardless of whether you were in West Texas and you were running sheep and goats or cattle yep. or the hill country or whatever. And over time, a couple of things have, have shifted. One, that wildlife is now, the recreational value of hunting and wildlife just being on the land is actually more valuable. And you can look at our, our, our profit and loss statement. Uh, more valuable than livestock. Uh, that would have been, un, it was unheard of, you know, fi even 50 years ago. And then the advent of whether you're a farmer or you have pasture land of renewable energy and being able to tap into the resource, you know, you get natural resources that as a, a sustainable landowner, you've got oil and gas and water underneath the surface. You have soil and uh, grasslands on and immediately above the surface. Well, now you can tap into solar and wind energy as well. Um, and so you see a lot of that. If you go to the Rio Grande Valley, you have a lot of solar energy still being able to farm land, but have that additional um, uh, revenue stream. And so that and technology has, you know, when I was growing up, there were probably three times as many people running 825,000 acres as there is today because now we've got trucks and we have GPSs and we have helicopters. I mean, not we, but right. the, jet, the collective we. Um, so things have certainly changed, but... And also many of the big properties have been broken up. That's right. right? In part, if you, if you go down to the Rio Grande Valley, part of that's just development pressure. You, 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 know, you have opportunity cost of, do I, do I keep farming this and generating $100 an acre? Right. Or do I sell it for $40,000 an acre? Well, uh, you know, when I look at taxes and estate taxes and all that stuff, it's, right. a, it's an easy uh, shift. In the Big Bend, there's a little bit of energy um, infrastructure that's starting to kind of move in um, as well. And so things are changing. But, yep. um, it, but at the same time, you do have these big swaths, whether it's uh, out in uh, the Big Bend region or even, you know, south of Corpus of what are, what are called by certain research institutes, the last frontier out in West Texas and the last great habitat. Yep. Um, and, and people are fighting to hang on to them because they know that, that uh, they're, they're some of the last um, there. So Jay is a sixth generation, right? Yes. You're sixth generation. Adair, you're a third generation El Paso. I, I am third right. generation. So, so you also, in your own way, have seen change. Absolutely. Right. So Jay talked about his view of change over time. Talk about your view of change over time in your part of the, of the border. Well, I'm growing, and grow, you know, El Paso, I can walk to, El pa to Juarez from my office, my office downtown in 20 minutes. Right. I, I don't think people realize our proximity. Yep. And so living on both sides was always a, a part of, you know, you're going out on a date and you go get your nails done in Juarez or you go to the market, but Dee and I were going to have a party. I'd go over and get, you know, uh, tequila and Wattis and I mean people just lived on both sides it's gotten hard people still do but it's, it's it gets harder and harder as things have right. gotten bigger and more you know more complicated but we've made a big effort through the Tom Lee Institute all of his books were about both sides of the border his art I wanted to just to get in a little plug for culture Jay talked about the black bear but also America's favorite period of art the New Deal era, with all those murals about our own history and to lift people's spirits during the Depression, the idea came from Mexico. And El Paso, I mean, it was, it was all those, mm. Si Quieros uh, Orozco, yeah. uh, all the uh, Rivera, all the great artists, that inspired. We saw how inspiring those murals were. And, and that's what I love about El Paso is we are just filled with murals. And I, you know, of course, when we walk over to Juarez, we see murals too. Yeah. And you can see this, uh, but I, and I, you, you just see, we help each other and we inspire each other. They've inspired us, certainly. That, that really has not changed. That, that has not changed, but we can lose sight of it when we don't right. interact the way we, we normally do. And actually why I, I like to take, I think people's visits to my city are so incomplete if they don't go back to where we began, right. which was 1659 in the mission in Juarez. And our, this is a great metaphor for the border. The mother mission is in Juarez. It dates from 1659. Uh, it was along the Camino Real on the yep. way to Santa Fe. Right. Our missions on our side of the river are the children of that mission. 
the moms on one side, Kids the on other the mission, yeah. and the, the, the river cut across cut across it. I mean, the, the border wasn't always there. You know, it wasn't always there. Right. One friend of mine calls borders the scars of history. Yeah. But we need to try to, you try to get erase scars and not, uh, you know, magnify them. Um, I'm conscious of our time. We've got about five minutes left. I want to ask each of you, beginning with the ambassador, we'll go down the line. So if we're having this conversation in 20 years, what would we be talking about? Either in reality or ideally. What is the future of the border region? I, I, I would mention very briefly two things. One is I think we have to look, continue to look closely at water. Yeah. Because the border region is uh, it's very dry. And as things look now, yep. we are going to have uh, you know, 15, 20 years from now, hopefully, we're not going to be discussing at least not as hard either immigration or security because we managed to tackle those successfully. But I think that the water on yep. the border is something that, yeah, and, and we're already working, but it's something that we would need to put attention. And the other thing, I, I, I still think it's trade. And trade. how do we use you know, our trade relation to the advantage of the border and everywhere else? Yep. We need to think, how is the world trade going to move? A bit like what Will was saying, 20 years, 25 years from now. What's going to happen worldwide in terms of trade relations? And figure out what's the type of border that we need in order to face that challenge. So water and trade, excellent. Jay, what would, what would you say we'd be talking about in 20 years from your perspective, or should be talking about? Yeah, I think um, hopefully we'd be talking about a true binational park uh, in the Big Bend region. It was something that, uh, that uh, FDR, yeah. when they established Big Bend, envisioned that it would actually span both sides of the border. There's about 5 million acres already protected between state and federal on both sides. Yeah. Um, that we prop up uh, those already uh, publicly protected areas. And then, you know, I, I talk a lot about it, about this, and I focus on it for my professional work, not because I have this necessarily romantic idea about it, because I do like to recreate in these areas. Yep. But it makes us resilient as a society. These open spaces, even in the Rio Grande Valley, where you've got about 4% of native habitat left, of this subtropic yep. environment, that it's beneficial, it makes us more resilient, not just as a society, but as a community, and that these wild things, as we've seen during the pandemic, these wild spaces uh, are also, you know, it's, it's free medicine uh, to a lot of us, and how do we incentivize not just that, but also uh, private landowners to maintain that open space and be productive because right. We have to be able to uh, eat and live off. Okay, of so life. we have water and trade. We have open spaces. Congressman, quickly, and then Adair. In, in and 20, tell me about 20 years from now. In, in 20 years, uh, border trade uh, that have come across the, the, the U.S.-Mexico border has tripled. Um, we, have, we have actually eliminated um, Ill illegal immigration because we took the measures necessary. And by doing all of that, uh, we were able to focus on these issues of economic um, opportunity, and we use those change in order to continue uh, America's role in, in the rest of the world. And kids then look back at 2021, 2017, 2013, the way we look back at the fact that doctors didn't wash their hands before they did surgery. Right. right? Um, or use leeches. Right. You know, and that's, that's how people look back to be like, man, yeah. we should have saw this a lot. A lot. But back, back then. There, finally, you. What would you say 20 years from now we're going to be talking about? Well, there's, I'm, I'm going to be talking about my city in El Paso. I mean, I, I'm going to be talking about, but if I can just give you, I mean, there's so many. The, the bridge, of course, right. you know, commerce and all that. But what we have such an opportunity for in El Paso Juarez now is with our medical school, our, the first medical school on the U.S.-Mexico border. We just got, and there's Paul Foster who found, gave him $50 million for a medical school. I mean, his mother-in-law started FEMAP in Juarez. I've been involved with that hospital for years. Well, now we have doctors who are coming who were with Doctors Without Borders. You know, we've always had these little yep. binational clinics where we're helping each other. And um, so it, in the medical field, I just think it can explode in becoming a center where we are for 
training. I think it'll be a culture cult for training, international training. See, yeah. we live an international life. So it's a, it's a great place to train people. You don't have to go other places. Come to El Paso Juarez. You can train to go anywhere in the well, world. Well, I think 20 years of that medical school, you're in, 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 indeed, that has the potential. It's to happening. Tra and, you, and, you, and UTEP, I'm going to mention one other thing. Can I mention one other? Very quick. Time? <laughs> Just one other thing, because one, one thing, uh, UTEP also, it is an open access university, but it's also an R1. Right. It's a re Research. it's open usually open it's open access. It's a community college, not yeah. a well. It's R1 too. So it is a unicorn, and we it's a unicorn. And Heather Heather Wilson, who's our new president there, uh, you know, I think with all the research grants and else coming in uh, into UTEP, it's really going to. Well, we'll, be, uh, to we'll surely be talking about that for sure. And if anybody in Dallas wants to go to the border, there's a flight to Del Rio, okay? That you, from here. From here, that you can go and see this and see Lake Amistad right. and 4,000-year-old rock art yeah. and things that are happening. But if you come to El Paso, I'll give you a personal <laughs> tour. I'll give you a personal tour, First Lady's tour. Well, I'm not First Lady anymore, but an Adair Margo tour to Wattis. We're, we're going to let the intramural feud. Go back 100 years before the United States was born. Um, Ambassador Jay, Congressman Adair, thank you so much. Uh, you. On behalf of the Bush Center, thank you to Highland Capital Management for being the presenting sponsor of the Engage series at the Bush Center. Thanks for making tonight's Highland Capital lecture such a special edition of the series. Save the date, I'm told to tell you, for the next Engage program on September 8th, an observance of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Details will be coming next month. Amazing. That's something that sort of hovered over this whole conversation today, didn't it? On your way out tonight, please take a few minutes to tour the Out of Many One special exhibit on immigration. I'm also asked to tell you that the museum store is open. And remember that President Bush's new book, Out of Many One, is available for purchase. Signed copies available for the low, low price of $43. Father's Day is just around the corner. Just saying. <laughs> uh, visit bushcenter.org slash immigration to review the Bush Institute's immigration policy, reform recommendations, and so much more. Thank you on behalf of everybody here for joining us. Good night. All right.